Welcome to the Renegade Millionaire Show, live from the beautiful TuneIn.com studio in Venice Beach, California. This is your host, Winnie Sun, founder and managing partner of Sun Group Wealth Partners, a financial planning firm based in Southern California. So this is radio, and you can't see me, but if you did, you know that I'm not your typical grandfather's financial advisor. So as you can imagine, in my role, I guess as a successful financial advisor, a market commentator on CNBC's Closing Bell broadcast, and a contributor to Forbes, I meet and surround myself every day with wealthy and extremely successful leaders in their fields. And I have some pretty cool friends, too. I just thought to myself, you know, I remember when we used to go to high school and some of the teachers would invite back some of the successful alumni. And those are some of my most fondest moments from high school. So why not do that now that we're grown up as leaders? And so that was the evolution of this show idea. Some incredible people sharing their very authentic, transparent stories are the ones that I wanted to share with an audience who are trying to build their own legacy. So again, welcome to the Renegade Millionaire Show. I have in the studio today my very good friend and founder and CEO of Hudson Jeans, the Peter Kim in the studio. He's the modern renaissance man, a true, true definition of a renegade. To give you a visual, because you have to, we have to, we have to talk radio here. I want to give you head to toe. So, Peter. Beautifully shaved head. He's got a leather jacket, white T-shirt, and of course his trademark tight, dark Hudson jeans with his very cool motorcycle boots. I love it. <laughs> so um, from there, thank you, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is great. Love you love it. the studio, isn't it beautiful? It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well. Um, <clears throat> Just last month, to give you well, to give you even more of a visual to see what uh, Peter looks like, I encourage you to Google uh, Winnie Sun and Forbes. Just Winnie Sun and Forbes will come right out because I had the chance and opportunity to interview Peter for Forbes and and ask him to join us today on TuneIn Radio. So tattoos all over, shaved head, spends hol- Halloween with his buddy, another Hudson Oscar nominated Kate Hudson. He oozes fashion icon cool, but yet in his early forties. He certainly looks younger than that, and of course he's wearing, you know, his cool jeans, so that helps. But so much smaller than what Peter is. Peter is in many ways almost like an aura. If you knew him firsthand, you would know that he isn't just what you might think of a typical LA-based hipster, premium denim designer who turned big overnight. Just to give you a little bit of the business side of it, in 2013, Joe's Jeans Incorporated acquired Hudson Jeans for about 65.4 million in cash and 27.5 million in convertible notes, totaling just shy of 100 million. So the, from the surface, you see Peter, everything what he's got, everything that he's got going on, and you would think that. He's got everything going for him. But actually, the transition to where Peter is today from where he was in 1994 is nothing shy of novel worthy. So, Peter, you went to work for your family's failing apparel business. You worked nonstop learning the business inside and out. Is that correct? Yes. So maybe you could tell me about that. I mean, you were only, you were so young. You were in your early 20s, right? This was a time where people were going on partying, but what were you doing? So I started in my family business <clears throat> when I was uh, basically 23. Um, it was 1994 when I started. Um, and basically I started as I was still going to school. I was going to college at USC, finishing out my last semester, and... <clears throat> It was basically spring break. It's kind of a funny story. At that time, it wasn't so funny, but it's kind of funny now. Spring break, I'm sleeping in. My father calls me and says, what are you doing? And I'm thinking, I'm sleeping. <laughs> and he goes, it's 9 o'clock. Why are you still sleeping? I go, it's spring break. I'm on vacation. And he goes, what is the matter with you? It's basically our company, the family business is in shambles right now. You need to come down and help. And I thought, 
well, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm on spring break. Leave me alone. I'm <laughs> sleeping. I go to party and so forth. So, and what was the family business? Uh, at, at that time, and still is actually, it's Missy Moderate Career Polyester Blouses. So um, it's, a, it's a product that um, uh, through the 80s and even into the early 90s, uh, it was for the working woman as dual income. Uh, professional women were women in the workplace were being respected and needed and so forth. <clears throat> so they had provided all the blouses and um, tops that went underneath the suiting. So um, um, uh, like lace knits, um, lace tops, uh, printed tops, you know, um, solid uh, blouses and so forth. And um, and of course, you're like you're 23 years old. You're in last semester at college. Why would Dad say come and help me with? Women's wear? You know, that's a great question. I'm not really sure. I never really asked. He just said, come down and help out any way you can. I thought, okay, fine. You know what? I, I'll, I'll wake up. I'll, I'll wake up and go down to the <laughs> office. And and I ended up really starting from the bottom because I had no qualifications. I didn't have no idea what I was doing. So I started uh, filing paperwork. Um, <clears throat> I worked in the warehouse. I did just errands. I cleaned up the uh, the. Um, the offices. I I was a driver to take documents back and forth. So you were errand boy. I was an I was like the all around utility guy that did that did um whatever needed to be done at the time. And it was a really interesting time because at first I thought what well, what ended up happening was after my spring break finished out, I uh, went back to school. I go to school in the morning, <clears throat> and then finish out the rest of my days in the office. Ended up graduating, and then uh, uh, basically I started my career right after that immediately into going full-time with my family business. So um, so let's talk about that. We had mentioned, I know, you know, as good friends, we've talked about this briefly, but you grew up in L.A. in somewhat of a, a pretty nice situation. I mean, it wasn't one of those rags to riches stories. You started off okay, right? I mean, I, I, I'd say I started off very well. I mean, and it's a bit... <clears throat> little uh, hard to imagine because my parents being immigrants from Korea came to this country with nothing, built this incredible business. We had a great home, went to fine school. I went to great schools, vacation. I mean, literally grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth. And as I start my career, the whole family business is just crashing down. It is coming down really fast. And it wasn't even like small. We're not talking about like a small business crashing. You're, we're talking, the company was $10 million in the hole, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you're stepping into just one of the most incredibly horrible situations where we had over $10 million in debt in 1994, which, you know, I look at $10 million today and that's a huge shit ton of money in yeah. today's world. Yeah, imagine then. In 94, you know, that it might have been like a billion dollars as far as I'm concerned. I am <clears throat> 23 at the time, fresh out of school. Uh, parents aren't getting along because there's so much tension and stress that they're constantly fighting. Our infrastructure was completely, it was a very, very weak infrastructure. Uh, we had a product that was really not relevant anymore in that, in this time. Um, they invested all their money into real estate. And at that, in the mid, early to mid nineties, it was kind of the, the same Second game that we saw uh, recently where very low down, highly leveraged. Um, and all they were losing all their property. And then the ultimate <clears throat> piece of it was, I guess a chair on top of all this was they had a, they had a person guaranteed a family member's Kawasaki Motorsport dealership. They go bankrupt. They take Kawasaki, the whole bill is on us now. So I'm stepping into this situation where I have absolutely no idea. First, it's like there. I have no idea where's up and down. Yeah, you're just a kid. You just graduated from school. You know, <laughs> your life is supposed to be so like open, and you're starting fresh. But you're like, oh, what did I just yeah. get myself into? But you, you know, you needed to help your parents, right? I mean, that was the way you were taught, right? My father used to say. My mother and father always used to say, "Well, what, what are you complaining about? We started with nothing." And <laughs> being the bratty kid that I was, I'd say. I wish I started with nothing because I'm starting in a deep, deep hole here. I'm starting with <laughs> negative. So yeah, I, you, it's, you're it's, in debt more than most people make in their lives, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So I step into the situation, which was, again, just unbelievably horrible. Um, I have seen some of the craziest things. I've seen two grown men. And at that time in my family business, because English is second language to my parents, the, the workforce was predominantly Korean people. 
And a lot of these Korean people, English is a second language Korean people. So I've seen, I've witnessed two grown Korean men, like, you know, you're the stereotypical Asian business guy in their short sleeve button up shirt with a necktie. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine that stereotype. I've seen two of these people in a full blown fist fight, ultimately wrestling on the floor in the office. And I just thought, what in the world is going on here? This is the craziest of scenarios I've ever seen. So every day I'd come in and just, it would be literally a shit show. I mean, it was like, it was like a a whole office of monkeys fucking a football is what it looked like all day long. <laughs> and I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so great. But, but you know what I love about this is, you know, I, I you told me this several times, but um, that was when you were, you were only in your 20s, that was one of your biggest rite of passages, right? Because you always told me, it's in those times where you're just like you feel like life is just horrible and you're in a black hole and you're like you're like struggling and life couldn't get any worse that you see like something so beautiful, right? Uh, I look back and I think those the hardships are probably the one of the best times of my life and I, I I have a name for it. I call it the abyss, the dark abyss, and it's it's a place where you're so deep, so you're just alone down in this dark, lonely abyss, and there's nobody else there with you. And I think all of us go through these situations, have these moments, and I think most of the time people are afraid of that place. And for sure, it's it's a very scary place. And I'm afraid of it as well all the time because it's unpleasant and it's really hard, and you're typically always going to be there by yourself. But I've come to really appreciate it and, in fact, love it because I think this is the place where you have – where you find discoveries of yourself, of mankind, of humanity, of – you know, you find these incredible moments of clarity, of of inspiration, of um, just and, – and I call these things treasures because I, I, I typically find that when I'm down there, I find these treasures of life – that are so incredible, so inspirational. They, they, they. Um, They're so authentic. Yeah, right? and, and and it really clarifies what I'm made of, what I'm prepared to do, what I need to do, and through this process, it it, it helps me tremendously to grow. And and I think the the crazy part about this is these treasures are only available and found in this dark, lonely abyss. Because when things are going smooth and everything is great. It's hard to. It's, I think it's impossible to find this. It's when you get down to these lowest points in your life that um, I think these things appear. And this is how I've, over my life, come to really enjoy this place and look forward to these things. I mean, we never look forward to it because it obviously means that it's not going well. But at the same time, when it doesn't, it helps me deal with the fear of getting into that place where not that it's you're fearless, but you can you can embrace it, you can understand it, and not be afraid of that emotion and that concept and charge into that place and figure out a way to get out of it. Well, you know, it, it's it's kind of <clears> like what they say is like sometimes it's that, that extra X factor that you see. I'm sure when you were 23 years old, it wasn't so clear. But yeah. now being in your 40s, it's crystal clear, yeah. right? So let's talk about that. I mean, from there, you worked your tail off. So talk about that, like a 20-some-year-old um, I guess you shouldn't say child, but young adult, <laughs> you know, inherits ten million dollars of debt with their family, um, family business, and of course you can't turn your back in front of me. Like, what do you do to get yourself? Because most people would say, "Oh, this is too much. Just declare bankruptcy and move on." Because I don't even know how. I, w- I don't even know how I would start clearing up ten million dollars in debt. So, but what did you do? Because I think that was just remarkable. So, you know, to me, the most important thing that <clears throat> happened for me at that time was, and it wasn't anything that's a business thing or a process or anything of that sort. <clears throat> After about six months, six to 12 months of being in this type of situation, I would complain every single day. Like every day I would say, this is bullshit. I can't believe this. Why me? Poor Peter. I don't deserve this. So I was going down this path of self-pity and, you know, just in this really negative place. And one day I'm driving down the freeway, I was going down the 10 freeway and I start having this conversation with myself. And Self. if it, it's kind of like, a, it was like almost divine intervention where I get picked up and kind of slapped around and 
And the conversation I'm having, again, I wish I could have seen this from a third-party perspective because I'm having a full-blown conversation with an imaginary person on the side. But the conversation went like this where I was having these moments of, oh, again, poor me. This is bullshit. I should just leave, get a job. I can do much better. I don't need to do, deal with this bullshit. And on the other side of it was, well, why don't you stop with this pity and this this approach and change the way you look at this, change your perspective? It's like, so what? You have a few problems. It's like, you know, boo fucking who? <laughs> you know, it's your, your parents came to this country with nothing and they've built something. And if you take a step further back, I look and say this whole Korean American community came to this country with nothing and have built something more important. And you can say that about all the communities that came in. And then if you keep taking a step back, I look at this whole country. If you look at this whole country, it started with nothing. It started with, it's, you know, it's, it's like the rebels, the, you know, the people that are the rejects. I mean, this is, this country was built on this mosh of randomness. And in a very short period of time, they, we have become one of the most, powerful and greatest countries in the world. So when I when I look back and said, okay, so I do have a few problems. It's not ideal, but at the same time it's it is what it is and and we just got to do what we have to do to get around this and the the process that I started understanding is if I fail, then you know, no one's going to blame me. The problem's too big, he's too young. It's it's just it's, it's, so let's just nothing. try. Yeah, there's nothing. But if I succeed, then I'm going to come out of this as a hero. So it was the first time I really was able to understand and connect with that emotion of I have nothing to lose. I have absolutely nothing to lose. So if we're going to go for this, if we're going to go down, at least let's go down fighting. And again, if we die, at least let's rip an ear off, bite off a nose, so that they will always remember that we were here. I was here. We st- stood our ground and we did everything possible to survive. And, you know, when I look at what my father taught me, he would always say, this is our debt. This belongs to us, and we have to do everything that we can to to settle this. And, again, this was the first time I really was able to understand that concept of, okay, I got nothing to lose, so we might as well go down fighting. So when I came back into the office the next morning, you know, everything was exactly the same. Papers were the same, same problem, same everything. But there was a massive shift that it wasn't the same anymore because now instead of being poor me, poor this, this sucks – everything turned into an opportunity. It's like, how can we fix it? This is amazing. It's a game. It's how can we find a solution? It's a game. It's like a, it's an activity. Like, it's almost like a challenge. Yeah, it became a complete challenge. And what are we going to do to beat and win this challenge? And just chopping down that debt, right? Slowly by slowly. So that was, I'd say, the biggest lesson that I had learned. And something that I constantly use all the time, whether it's real or not, is always going into a situation with, I have nothing to lose because the worst and we talk about this a lot till this day, the worst that can happen is it doesn't work. The worst that can happen is we go out of business. Mm-hmm. The worst that can happen is, shit, we die. You know, exactly. you know, it's like that's the worst that can happen. It's but no matter what, bad. yeah, it's mm-hmm. not that bad. We, we will always try. figure out a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, I, and that's one of the things I also do believe is that when you, when you have a passion for something, you do everything you can to go after it. And it's so important and you're, you believe in it so much that you are willing to die for it, literally or figuratively. And I think I found that moving in that pattern and having that kind of perspective, typically good things come out of it. So coming out of this, I looked at the situation and said, okay, what can we do now and how are we going to f- fix this? And it was you know, fairly simple. The bigger chunks of it was let's first get the debt stabilized. So we sat down with – let's first get the debt stabilized – get the infrastructure working properly, and then get the product back to what is relevant. So when I say got the debt stabilized, I ended up, me and my father ended up going to all of our creditors and sitting down with them and saying, hey, we have this plan. Give us some time. All, all we're asking for is move short-term debt into long-term debt, and we'll figure out a way to pay this off. Here's what here's what we're proposing to do. And pretty much everybody cooperated and helped us out. Because that was a difficult time. It wasn't just your parents' business, right? That time, yeah. the garment industry was in despair, yeah. right? So this was just... It was a common thing, and companies were going bankrupt. Yeah. But the difference here was that you and your dad made a conscious decision that, no, we're owning this, and we're going to make yeah. it right. right. So to you, that w- it was not an option to go bankrupt. It, it really wasn't. Um, I guess, you know, and I think there's another important lesson that I learned through this is you always do the right thing, and you act with honor, with respect. And my parents, 
they had always done so. So they had the respect of the community of the industry. So when we went out to them for and asked for help, they all cooperated because they knew that this they wasn't just you. yeah, it wasn't just a line or a pitch or a scam. They knew that we really meant it and were sincere about it. And I think that there's a lot of goodwill in that where you can be a total asshole, be a dick business person when the times are good. And you see a lot of that where people start believing their own hype and things start going well and they start treating, mistreating people or not acting, um, I guess, appropriately. And at that point, people will have to deal with you only because they have to. But the, I find a lot of times you see this is when you start having trouble, they're not going to deal with you anymore. They're going to be like, you know what, let them go because the person was a complete asshole. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's it. So, you know, that's one of the really important things that I thought I pulled out of this is just watching my parents and how they ran their business and what was the outcome is we always have to make sure that we do the right thing and There's treat people with respect. respect. Yeah, mm-hmm. just treat people with respect. And so we sat down with all the creditors. We let them know what was going on. So we were able to stabilize the debt. The infrastructure, again, was – this was a real difficult one. I'd say this is more difficult than the debt process because a lot of the people here were friends. They were family members or the people that have been there for years. And initially I came in and said, we have to – we have to get rid of everybody. So we have first to start you came fresh. in as an errand boy, then you came to help restructure debt, and then you're like, I need a clean house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like, must we, have been so popular <laughs> <laughs> that holiday season. And, and you know, I'm this young kid, mm-hmm. 23, 24 Graduate at this point. Graduate from USC, now you think you know everything, yeah, right? Yeah, and it, absolutely. And it's, it's, on that note, it's somewhat embarrassing. I, I would think back on some of the stuff I used to say to my parents, going, oh my God, how embarrassing. <laughs> But and, and again, because pr- the workforce was predominantly Korean, you have this whole respect and honor thing. So they're looking at me as you know the snot nosed shithead, boss's son, mm-hmm. and so I would I would have to sit there and and, and on, on the other side of it, my father would never tell anybody that I'm the new head of the company, and I would ask him all the time, I'm like, you have to at least tell them to listen to me because no I'm respect, making the decisions because right? mm-hmm. I'm not getting the respect. Mm-hmm. And he goes, no, I'm not going to do that. You need to figure it out and just do whatever you have to do. And I thought, wow, what an asshole, man. This really <laughs> sucks. It's not that it's, – it's already hard enough. So the, the, the way I figured that out or got around that situation is I just decided to work harder than anybody else. It's like, you know, I get in early – do everything that I have to do, do things that people aren't willing to do and take it as far as I can to basically earn their respect. And as I'm doing that, I'm telling my parents, we have to get rid of this workforce. They're like, you can't touch them. So I basically had like the bad news bears of of a team. And because I couldn't replace any of them, just had to do our best to work within the group. And oh, you we, couldn't even replace it. No. The so, public employees. Right. So now, now we're we're – and again, this was an That's interesting. A tough hand. It was an interesting time because it's literally the bad news bears, mm-hmm. and how do we squeeze and get the most out of each person to perform at the highest level? Which, you know, I tried a lot of different ways. One was, you know, the whole get angry, fear based, carrot and stick method, and really found that that didn't quite work as well, or it wasn't the kind of culture that I wanted to create. I wanted people to be there and work hard because they wanted to work hard as opposed to because they have to work hard. So I found that that was a much better way to not only to get people to perform, but actually people to feel good about themselves and good about the company that they're working with. So really focus on that and getting this infrastructure and processes set. And then on the product side, just how do we figure out a different product that's more relevant for today's time? So that there was basically that three-part process. And as we're rolling through this, it started working. It started getting better and better. And by... I ended up taking over the company fully around 1997, 98. By 1999, the company became profitable. It was moving in the right direction. And at that point, I thought, you know what? I found that I love this business. I love the apparel business. I have this massive passion for it. Um, it just may not be women's blouses. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just maybe it's not Missy Modern Career Polyester of blouses. And for me, I just had this bigger message I wanted to share with the world. Um, and I needed a bigger platform, I thought, something that um, what people find interesting. And I didn't think that they'd find this piece interesting. And I took – so I started branching off into other uh, companies, brands. I started a young men's streetwear company called Drunken Monkey, mm-hmm. which was in 99. <clears throat> My first run of premium denim was in 2000. So I'm expanding pretty aggressively. And a, and a lot of people around me, they – there was a lot of criticism saying, why are you doing this? You should stay focused. You're doing so well. This company's doing it's, it's on its way, and you're going to make a lot of money and be super successful. 
And for me, I thought, you know what? I know that that's probably the most probable outcome because it's moving in the right direction. It's doing well. But, but money just, wasn't everything yeah, to you. It was actually it had nothing to do with any of it because mm-hmm. I just figured that I want to do things that are inspiring, that is super cool, that can has the ability to change the world in a diff, in a in a positive way. And I figure if I'm passionate about this and if I can make this piece of it work, then the money will follow. And if it doesn't, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather do something that I love and be happy and satisfied with my life than doing something that I don't but having money with it because I think happiness and money have nothing to do with each other. I totally agree. So let's talk about that. So that you sold Drunken Monkey to FUBU, right? Sold it to uh, two brothers brothers. that were partners with FUBU. Okay. Sold that. Well, start, started in 99, started uh, my first run of premium denim in 2000, Jane's Army. That thing had a great start, but then we, we couldn't execute it properly. So then we shut that down quickly. And at that point is when I found this passion and love of denim and that it's a new category of premium denim. It was, mm-hmm. made it even in, more incredibly cool because it's. I found that it's a, almost a perfect product for me to represent everything that I stand for and And a lot of that is, I mean, I look at denim as the basis and origin of denim is workwear. It's low class, blue collar. You have grit in your fingernails. It's, you know, you're just, you're a a blue collar working class. And, you know, till this day, you, there's a lot of country clubs and places where denim is not Not really accepted. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's so widely accepted. It's so cool. And it's, it's just cool. So. When for the origins of denim to come from where it is, and then today's world it becoming premium. To me, I thought it was like the ultimate fuck you to society <laughs> and to uh, the status quo. To say, look, th- one thing, the thing that you one time looked down on and ridiculed is now high fashion and basically the foundation of of a person's wardrobe. So. I thought this is amazing. This is so perfect because it's ultimate representation of rebellion and irreverence and you know, renegade. So, mm-hmm. so got into that and found another, I found a designer, started Hudson in 2002. So I'm sure you get asked this all the time. So tell us how you came up with the name Hudson. You know, it first started with the British uh, flag, the Union Jack, and the designer I had at that time, he was a French guy with a pretty heavy French accent. And he said, I want to use this. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, it represents something new and something old. And when I think about it, I'm not exactly sure if that's what he exactly said, but that's what I heard and wanted to hear because I thought, oh, that's super that's cool. So cool. This uh, this old school, new school, and this blending to make something, uh, old world, new world, blending that and to create something completely new. So I love that concept. And with that, what we're doing is trying to look for a name that lived in both worlds. And, you know, I, I, I don't want – I didn't want to call it Peter's Jeans or, you know, <laughs> something like that. So I, I, I've not never, that cool. Yeah, <laughs> I'm never a big fan of calling something yourself. And I know it's a very popular thing and common thing. It's just I'm not so much of a fan of that. So we're looking for a name that represented something that lived in both worlds. And Hudson seemed to be like a perfect – perfect thing Mm -hmm. you know when we when we put it out there just for whatever reason and i can't even explain it it just felt right it just felt like oh this is it this is home so that's how we ended up with the name very cool so i mean i think that the what i love for you to share with our audience is that it's not so much i mean it's about denim but it's about lifestyle but there's so much more to that it isn't about (sighs) selling so many i mean it is about selling a lot of jeans but selling so much that it ends up in your pocketbook. But there's so much more to it. Because you talked about when you think of a business, of a corporation, it can have a, such a purpose yeah. in the world. Can you share with the audience a little bit about that? Well, I'll take a step back and per- first um, preface everything by saying that I'm a big conspiracy theory believer. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe more than conspiracy theory, I believe that everything that we've been taught Traditions, rules, culture, um, what's right and wrong, education, religion. I mean, I, I believe everything that we've been taught at the very least needs to be questioned. At the very least because I think there's just something wrong with it. And I think that it, they were created by people that had a very specific agenda or a group that had a very specific agenda. And, it, and that agenda was not necessarily for the betterment of the masses. So – I come from that school of thought, and it will be the basis of 
I guess everything we're going to talk about at this point because there's a common thing of always going back and questioning. So when so I was going to school, back, do you sit back at home and you just think? Because <laughs> I do that. I'm guessing you do that in the car. You probably just, like these these thoughts and you question. I'm questioning things constantly, like all day long, everywhere, driving, walking, standing in line, taking a shit, taking a <laughs> piss. You know, anywhere I am, I'm always questioning and thinking about stuff. And it gets to a point where sometimes it's too much. Your wife's like, yeah, yeah. she's just like, <laughs> she's like, what's the matter with you? Why can't it just be a light day? It's like, I don't know. It's not that heavy for me. It's just normal for me. But to go back to answer your question, based on that belief, as I was going through school and um, adolescence and just going through life, I've always been taught that the purpose of business is to make money. And that's what was hammered into me. And I'm, I don't know what they're teaching in schools today, but back in you know the 80s, in the 90s, that's what was taught. It's about, it's about profits. It's about cash flow. Yeah, you can have culture and this, that, and the other, but the sole purpose is money because without money, you don't have a business. And, you know, I think about that and say, God, that sounds so crazy. And I say that because if you look at a business, it's got so much power. And it could be like Apple, which is the most valuable company in the world, to a small little co- – one little coffee shop in a neighborhood and anything in between. And I think the power that all of these businesses have is incredible. You know, this coffee shop could be a place where people find, you know, their their space, their their uh, peace, and the incredible creative ideas come out of here. They, it, it's, it's home for some people. It maybe employs one or two people to, on the other extreme, it, it, it creates, in, Apple creates incredible product that's changed the world, that mm-hmm. has this culture, and again, anything in between. So something with this kind of power, I always find it, it, it's, to me, it's impossible to believe that the purpose of something is to make money, because money, by definition, is a medium a of exchange yeah. They're just like with marbles. a foundation of gold or currency, and it's a tool, right? It's like it's literally a tool, like a hammer or a fork. And I couldn't, I can't even imagine that being the purpose. And the analogy that I always give is to me, it's like a car and gas. It's like the purpose of a car is not to amount as much gas as you possibly can. Of course, gas is important. It's the thing that fuels it. The more gas you have, the further it goes. But the purpose is not to amount as much gas. And to me, I look at a business in a very similar way. The purpose of a business needs to have a purpose. There needs to be something greater than let's make money. The money is important. It is an absolute necessity. The more money you have, the more you can do, the farther you can push it. But it's not just to get as much of this as possible. And I just believe that commerce, business, and capitalism should have a purpose that's greater than something that's going to benefit the world in a positive way, hopefully. So some people would say, well, that's easy for you to say, Peter, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, Hudson jeans sold the Joe's jeans for hundred million. It's much easier to say this side of the table. But maybe you could talk about a little bit what you've done with <clears throat> your team at Hudson and made your little bit or your impact with one voice. So, you know, one of the big things that we focus in on is culture of the company because I think that is uh, probably the most important thing to me. The culture of the company is the brand of the company. And what we always talk about internally is the number one thing that we focus in on is employee experience, first and foremost, and then customer experience after that. Because your employees love you. I've been to your headquarters. I mean, you're surrounded not by employees. You're surrounded by, like, family. Yeah. To me, our, the only reason that our company is where it is is because we have incredible, incredible people that – are passionate about what they do. They care about what they're doing. They care about the people around them. So it really is like a family. And yeah, we have our debates. We have our fights. We have our arguments. But we have it because at the end of the day, we all know that it's not for ego, for self, but for the betterment of the business. You have the same goal. You have the same goal. And we're aligned in something greater than ourselves as individuals. So that's probably the thing that I'm most proud about about our company is we have just incredible people that not only surround me, but surround each other because we all, our goal is for everyone to hold each other accountable to make sure that we are, we are, you know, living the life that we have put out there and being consistent. And, and we mess up, we mess up all the time, but how do we continuously improve, evolve, learn, and keep pushing it forward? So that's been really the biggest focus is creating an environment where people can thrive and be really happy with what they are. And, you know, one of the things I always talk about internally is I say, look, if you if you don't wake up every morning 
and can't wait to get into work and you're passionate about what you do here and believe in the message, then you don't belong here. You need to go and find another job. And at first, people are like, whoa, is, he's like kind of threatening us. What the hell? I'm like, no, I'm not threatening anybody. I'm not saying this in a negative way. I'm saying this in a way that I want you to be jacked up. I want you to be passionate. I want you to be like on fire. So when you come in here, you gotta you got to be about what we're about. And then because because it's not my message, it's got to be our message and our goal and mission. And if we can create this kind of environment for people, then you don't have to ask people to work hard. They're going to want to. They're going to want to work hard because it's it's part of them. So, that's I think the most important thing that we work on is how do we create this internal environment and culture where people are not only paid well because I think I think the pay aspect is probably the most irrelevant piece of it because you know I, I it bothers me when people say well I have to take this job because of my salary because of the benefits I look at them and go well you're not just kind of hiding you know you're you're getting paid what you're getting paid because that's what you're worth so i got to imagine that wherever you go you're going to be able to make the same amount of money give or take let's say 10% but 10% is not going to kill anybody you know maybe it's a slight adjustment down or up but you're got, why would you be afraid of losing the pay and benefits oh it's a top market but it's like but you're here <laughs> in our company like you're here we don't sit there and take hacks and people that can't do the job it's like you're you obviously you have talent and ability so you got to have confidence in yourself that you can go out and find another job so let's take the pay situation out of the equation because what we always strive for is to pay at the minimum uh fair but we always like to pay people higher than market average so that they not to are, mention how generous you are with employee benefits i mean and I think that's another big one you know one of the and I never knew that it was something different because I've always we give like full health care, full mm-hmm. dental, and I've never realized that that was a big benefit because my my perspective. And we not only do we give it to employees, but we give it to the whole family as well. So if you have if you're you know married with three kids, the whole family is covered with this insurance. And again, I just thought, isn't this normal? I mean, shouldn't we be taking care of the the? Not this only, is not normal. For you. And I found out it's not. <laughs> and that's when I thought, okay, well, that's kind of cool, but um, you know. I think this is really, again, the most important thing is how do we make people just excited about where they are? And if you take that money equation out and you create this environment where they're just thriving and they're in, and just loving what they do, they're believing in the concept, they're believing in the in the cause and the mission. And then through that, I think that automatically bleeds out into everything they do. So the next stage is being the customer experience is if you have, I think if you have passionate, happy, uh, um, incredible employees, and it's maybe it's not even that's not even the right word because a lot of things that I focus in on, a lot of times, and especially in the beginning, I talk about life and personalities and you know, individual spiritual growth, and I could tell like a lot of people are looking at me going, "What in the world does this have to do with our job?" And fundamentally, what I think is my focus and my objective and job is to make sure that each person is the most incredible person that they can be whether they're here or anywhere else, because if they're incredible people, then they, they're going to be incredible employees, and it's just a natural um, progression. So once we create that, I mean, I just believe that that's going to automatically come out into the love of product, the love of customer service, the production, the quality, and that will go out into the customer experience. And how can we make sure that what we feel here and what we believe in, how do we keep communicating that and sharing that with our community and our customer base? So... So that, how do you do that, Peter? I mean, I've met some of your team. They're the most diverse group, but they all absolutely love working with you and at Hudson Jeans. So for like a for an, a regular business owner, you know, who's trying to develop. I mean, you're running full speed ahead all the time. You are so busy. You're just saying, how do you connect with 140 plus employees? I mean, again, I to me. At this point, it's because I just have incredible people around me. You know, Barbara, our president, mm-hmm. Ben, our designer. We have Rob as our COO, a CFO, COO. We have, you know, just incre- you know, Tracy in our HR department. Mm-hmm. We just have what, – what I found is when we hire people, and I've made this mistake where we're t- at today's what we do is we make sure that we hire people that not only can do the job but that's going to fit culturally, that believe in our mission, believe in our message, and culture is going to fit – and these two things are equally as important. You can't have one without the other, and that's how we do. That's we do our best to hire based on that criteria. In the past, I haven't, and I learned, I guess, the hard way, as they say. 
because I would hire people that they can absolutely do the job. They were, you know, ringers, they were rainmakers, but they didn't quite fit with the culture that I wanted to happen. So, yes, they can, maybe they're performing on a, on a business perspective, professional perspective, but if they can't get along with others, if they can't spread the message, if they can't, not only not only if they don't believe it, if they don't believe in it, if they're not about it, they're for sure not going to live it. So, so I've had that experience of people being able to do the job, but then wasn't quite a fit, and that's a short-term thing. So, again, at this point, because the company has grown and there's so many more people and it's more of a global business, we just have a lot of – every one of us is an ambassador. You know, I look at myself as just an ambassador of the company, and there's, there's 150 of us that are ambassadors, and that's why I think it's so important that every one of them understands, believes, and lives it because they are a reflection of this family and this group of um, – of our group, so. So happy people make beautiful genes, right? <laughs> happy people, I think, make a beautiful world. Right. right. So, so through that, another big piece that I believe in is just giving back and the community part of it. And uh, to just to answer your question, how, how I first started in this thing was it was about 14 years ago. And it was when I was still struggling, still trying to make ends meet, and I was either still digging out of a hole or investing into new companies. And I remember clearly my father was like, you know what? I understand what you're doing. I have a lot of respect for it, but you're not ready. You can barely take care of yourself. You should wait, get more established. At that point, you can start helping the community. And I looked at him and said, you know what? With all due respect, I understand what you're saying, and it makes sense to me, but I am i don't – I was like, hey, well, what, what have you done? And he's like, well, you know, I want to – you know what I want to do, start a foundation and do this and do that. And I go, so what happened to that? And he goes, ah, what do you mean? You know, the company didn't do so well, so we couldn't really start it. And for me, I thought, well, that's that's one way to go about it. And I'm not going to say what's right and wrong. But just my process, my perspective is I have no idea when I'm going to be dead. Like I could die like right now of a heart attack. So I just thought, you know, let's just start with one. And if I can help one person and – if it's one person now because that's all I have, then that's what it is. But at least if I die tonight, then I'll know that I had some kind of impact on this one person. And as we grow and get bigger, we can, it can be two, it can be four, and, and so forth. So it started back in um, like early 2000. And what I f- like to focus in on is children, like young as, as young as we can possibly make an impact on. And my thought process behind that is like it, it, as you're building a building – if you're off by like an inch at the foundation, basically by the time you get up to like the second or third floor, the whole building is is screwed up, right? You can't have right. that so even off a small little uh, start um, young. Uh, difference. So my thought was using that same analogy and saying, hey, if I can start with like a, a five or six year old, if I can, because we're a small company, with not big resources, but if I can make like a one inch difference in their life, then hopefully that small gap over a longer period of time creates a much bigger gap. So by the time they're 15, 16 and older, their their whole life goes into a whole different trajectory than, than where it was originally heading. So, so focus on children. And another thing I believe is it's not just the money part of it. I think what's also really important is that there's a human element. There's a connection of energy, of of being able to look at it and touch it and experience it. And so we, we focus very specifically in our own community. So we do work with uh, mainly like Watts and South Central. So And then working with various different groups and finally, about seven, eight years ago, came about came together with One Voice through uh, a, a friend who started managing all of our charitable endeavors and just got super he- heavy and deep with the One Voice program, which is an amazing program based out here in L.A. And they focus with uh, – they, their main focus is helping families and helping families that live uh, at or below the poverty level. So, so many of the families are homeless. Then, oh, right? it's it's unbelievable. We've done work with um, like Skid Row with the homeless groups, and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like things that I look at and say, this is unbelievable. We live in supposedly the greatest country in the world, one of the richest countries in the world. We live in a city that's like, you know, it's Los Angeles, right? Mm-hmm. And last year during the holidays. I took my kids, I have twin girls, that I took them down to, um, we're passing out uh, relief kit, um, hygiene kits and food and so forth to the homeless. And it literally took, because it was the 24th in the morning, it took us about 10, 15 minutes door to door to go from my house to Skid Row. And I'm sitting there going, this is unbelievable. I mean, how does this even exist in our city, in our country, that people are starving to death? 
and don't have homes and live in conditions that, you know, if, if we found a dog in that condition, the person would be like, they go to jail. Right. If we found a dog or a cat or some kind of animal in these kind of conditions that they live in and, and people live in these conditions all the time. And I think we look at it and say, well, let's look the other way, which is, mm-hmm. it's really tough. But, um, you know, I think that's, I guess the goal here is how do we keep improving this process? So we've done a lot of work with the One Voice program. Um, one of the things that we did, which I'm super proud of, is we, we create this, we support two schools, um, uh, element, uh, kindergarten, um, preschool and kindergarten. And my, fu- my belief is I think that most people want to do good. Most people, maybe not all, but the majority of people want to do good. But a lot of times what happens is when you think about the problems, they become so big, they become so overwhelming, and you start losing you know, oh, my God, it's what am I going to do? Where do I start? Who do I give to Red Cross, you know, this or that? Where am I going to go? I, and then ultimately you just go, ah, forget it. You know, I'm going to just do nothing. Maybe I'll give some money to a bum on the street. So what I found is that through my experience, you know, when I first started, I felt like I was cheating because I would, I would give money, time, and I'd go down to the communities and help out. And what ended up happening was I would leave these places feeling amazing about myself and getting more out of this process than what I thought I was giving. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I started getting super guilty, like, oh, man, this sucks. I mean, I'm supposed to help them, and they're helping me. So I give more. The more you give, the more more you get gratified, and and the more you learn. And you can't write check big enough. Yeah, and you keep going back for it. And finally, that was what I found was, like, the most amazing thing was when I started, I wanted to help out, and in turn, I was getting helped out myself in different ways. And I think that's really the magic of this thing where you – look out for more than yourself and when you look at your brothers and sisters and say well if this person's down how can I help and as you help you start learning things about yourself and and there's this incredible energy that starts uh, uh, creating and I wanted to pass that along to my staff and my the, the employees in our company so we created this program where we support two schools every month we bring in a different experience like science um, arts and crafts, music, um, like all sorts of different programs. Every month we go in and we open up to the whole company to say, whoever wants to go down and help out this day, you guys are welcome. It's usually from like 8 to 12. It's a it's a free paid day. Just go down there. You, there's not much to do. Just maybe carry some stuff around, play with the kids, and, you know, just be, be loving and be caring and, you know, get out there. And uh, it's a program that I think is incredible. I, I love it. Uh, and it's something that we're just super proud of. So do you go every month? I try to go. It gets hard because of this travel schedule, but I try mm-hmm. to go to as many as I possibly can. I'd probably go to maybe three, four uh, of those, and then mm-hmm. we do this other program, um, which is uh, packing bags, where you know, a lot of these kids that come out of these um, under the poverty-stricken neighborhoods, they're incredibly smart. They're incredibly resourceful, and they go to incredible schools and That's colleges. That's what you're saying, and they don't have any money to buy yes. school supplies. Right? So one of the programs that we had, and this is one that I go every year because I think it's incredibly inspiring and love to meet these kids, is we go to Target, and they have a budget of $1,000, and we go and buy them all their basic necessities and all the things that they need to take to college because what we want them to do is get there with their head up high, with respect, where they don't have to you know, where they don't have some of the basic materials. And and I found that it was, when I first had a couple of years, I didn't really think, it didn't really hit me too much. And because I thought, this is great, we get them all their stuff and so forth. And one year, what happened was, because after you go through your essential needs, you have like whatever's left over, you can maybe splurge on like a, a guilty item. And one of the kids, he goes, I go, he goes, I've always wanted an iPod or something like that. And I went, well, you have like 300 bucks left over. Why don't you get it? He goes, 300 dollars. What do you mean? I go, didn't you hear how this program works? I mean, weren't you listening? He goes, no. I go, you have a thousand dollars. We have a thousand dollars to spend, and after your essentials, you can get whatever you like. And he's like, a thousand dollars, and that's when I really felt it because you know a lot of times you take it for granted. Like a, you know, when at a certain point, thousand dollars, yeah, it's a lot of money, but at the same time, to buy all your stuff. And we're buying like sheets, pillows, like some basic necessities. And I realized that, wow, this is probably an experience that this person has never had up until this point. Not, at first, they're young. They're like, you know, 18 years old. But at the same time, when you're living below poverty, to spend in one shot $1,000 on a shopping spree, that's like, that's unheard of, right? So I, I didn't quite understand the magnitude of that situation until that moment I realized, oh, wow, this is 
kind of intense. So this is deep. It's deep, and but it's it's awesome because these kids, they you know, they go to incredible, incredible colleges. And one of the things that I found just incredibly satisfying is a lot of these kids that we send off, we've actually taken three or four of them back as interns during summer that That's they come back awesome. to the company and they work for us they as interns. They must love you. And it's pretty cool. It's like a really cool experience. It's kind of full circle. Yeah. Talk about the, you know, like... It, all these companies now are competing for the top employees, right? Yeah. They're all, like, especially in Silicon Valley. But imagine if more companies engaged in a process like this. You know, you wouldn't always have to compete against the next Google because this employee you would have had helped at such an early and important stage of their life. Yeah. You were then somebody that would, they would really take very seriously. Yeah. You know, it's again, big. our 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 goal is just how do we continuously make positive impacts in the world. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Peter, as a parent, I have to ask you. Yeah. I mean, what do you hope your legacy to be? And most importantly, you know, as as a parent, what do you hope that your daughters will learn from this extensive journey that you've had so far? You know, it's an interesting question, and I've had this conversation with my kids actually fairly often. And, you know, one time we were driving, and they were maybe like, 11 or 12 at the time and it was just a conversation came up and I said you know do you know why I work as hard as I do and why I live my life the way I do and their immediate response was so we can have all these nice things and and you know buy things and go on vacation and stuff and I said well you know that's that's part of it that's the outcome of what happens but I love what I do I have this passion for this cause, this mission of what I'm trying to share with the world. And through that process, it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of effort. And one of the things that um, that's, a, I guess, a sacrifice, for lack of a better word, is we don't get to spend as much time as as we get to as we could. And that's why, for me, it's like whenever we do have the time, which is usually the weekends, like from Friday to Sunday, it's like that's why I want to make it as impactful and quality and just hardcore as we possibly can and this is what I'm chasing after is, is a dream that I have and, and doing everything I possibly can to live this dream. And what I hope that my kids pull from this and understand from this and what I told them is it's important that you guys have a dream, you guys have a mission, you guys have a passion for whatever you love to do and don't let anybody tell you any otherwise. Don't let people judge it. Don't let people tell you it's wrong or it's not right because if it's right for you and it's a positive thing, then – you should do everything you can to go after that. And sometimes it means a sacrifice of time and, and um, well, it's time with family and loved ones. But I think what's most important is that you are passionate about something and you give it everything you possibly can to go after it. And, you know, this was, I, it was like, do you understand that? And they're like, yeah, I think we do. And their question was, well, what if you don't agree with it? I'm like, that's okay too. I mean, it, even if I don't agree with it, if you believe in it, and if it's something that you love, then you have to go after it and give it everything you possibly can. So, you know, that's a that's a big thing for me. Um, it's really one of the, I guess, the message and missions of Hudson itself, which is what we're trying to do is help people understand that, you know, life isn't about this image that you see on a billboard or a magazine or, uh, you know, whatever image that we do. I mean, I always get kind of nutty about when in our in our space in the fashion space when people start talking about aspiration this is the aspirational look and and lifestyle and I look I go what is you know like this this image of a person who isn't even really a, a real person because you know in our in our industry we photoshop the crap out of people so you take a already beautiful person and then you cut them into something that's just absolutely unrealistic so to me, this is not aspirational. This is a look. This is an image that is created. I think really what's aspirational is are you true to yourself? Are you living the life that you want to live? And are you living your dreams and living it passionately? So to me, this is, I guess, one of the biggest uh, messages I want to give my kids as well as share with, with the world, not just my children, but anybody else that's interested in listening is, you know, we have to be true to ourselves. And I mean, as I mentioned before, the other part of it that I want them always to do, and again, I hope that many other people do, is just start questioning things. You know, I think all the stuff that we've been taught is just, again, it's 
it's highly, highly questionable. And I'll take like even a simple thing like experience. You know, people think experience is a great thing. I have 30, 40 years of experience in this. And I believe the key to life or the secret to life is creativity. And I don't mean creativity in the sense of let's make cool shit because that's kind of like the the common thing. And typically the perspective is creativity is for some, not for all. And I don't really buy that. I don't believe in that because I think creativity – like happiness is a mindset. It is a perspective. It's a lens of how you look at the world. And I bring experience in this because I think creativity is a key, but also experience is one of the things that kills creativity because what I always find interesting is, you know, people rely on their experience, rely on their past and say, I did this like this. We did this here. We did this there. And it worked in this situation. So it's going to work here as well. I look at that and I think that's crazy. It's illogical because today is a whole different day than yesterday. It's, the world has moved. It's changed. We have grown. We are not the same people. It is not the same situation. No matter how much it looks exactly the same, it is not the same. And I find it interesting that people want to use past experiences and apply it to today's situations. And even what's crazier is use that same experience and try to build a, a future of tomorrow. And I think to me, that creativity has got to come in with an open mind with this. Let's not come into any kind of situation with built-up walls and boundaries. It's I think the purpose and, and the function of creativity is how can we dream up the most incredibly impossible, crazy scenario? And then if, we, if our little pea brains can figure this out, then imagine it, then we should be able to create it. And I think it was – I forget who it says, but if you can dream it, you can do it. And I absolutely believe in that. So, you know – the other message that I always want to uh, pass on to my kids is question everything. Everything that you have been told, you need to question it, you need to challenge it, you need to figure it out because to me it's not about experience or the past that's important. It's taking that experience and how do you convert that into knowledge and wisdom and have that understanding you know, evolve into today's world and, again, keep evolving into tomorrow's future. So that's a, that's a big thing that we talk a lot about in our family is having independent thinking, don't get tied in. Like they go to school and I tell them, because I, I have a big problem with edu- the educational process. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I think I know. the purpose of education, in my mind, is really to open up the mind. You know, it's like the broaden your horizons, create and spark cre- uh, curiosity and start exploring and questioning. And I think what our traditional educational process has done is the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. It, it funnels you into thinking that this is right, this is wrong. And I tell my kids all the time, it's important because they'll ask about grades and I'll say, grades are not important. It doesn't matter. Just do give it your all and whatever happens, happens. And I said, all of this stuff is questionable except for maybe math and science. Maybe, but it's a total anti-Asian parent yeah, response, yeah. right? <laughs> it's completely. <laughs> I've never helped my kids with homework because I think I actually tried to in the early years, and it was a complete disaster. Because first of all, I'm not qualified to teach anybody anything, you know, it's, <laughs> especially with the academics. I didn't do too well in school, so I'm thinking. And plus, they're they're bringing on problems. I'm thinking, looking at it, going, well, I don't even understand the question. I'm not sure what we're <laughs> supposed to do. And um, you know, I stopped helping them with homework because I realized that I was, I was doing, I was uh, continuing a process of. To me, I think learning is one of the most incredible experiences ever. And what we do is we strip away people's. Uh, passion for learning. The joy of learning. The joy of learning because, Mm -hmm. again, it becomes that carrot and stick formula. It becomes a formula that you just go through like one path. Right. You study this, you memorize that, Mm -hmm. and you take the test. Take the test. You get either an A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. And if you get an A, you did well. If you didn't, then you didn't. But I think what's more important is what are you taking away from this experience? What are you taking away from this this, uh, information? And what kind of knowledge? And again, wisdom, are you learning from it? That isn't exactly that. And people will say, well, what about history? You know, that's pretty exact. I'm like, bullshit. That's not, history is like one of the most questionable things. Because as we all know, it's history is written and documented by the person who won. And you can see this all over the place between from, you know, from the Korea-Japan situation to uh, the Nazi-German-Jewish situation to, you know, like a- a- any anywhere you go, they all have a different perspective on 
history. So, I mean, English history, I mean, everything I think is completely open. And instead of ha- teaching that, I think we were taught that this is what happened or this is where you're supposed to do things. And again, I just don't believe in any of that. So so let the, let the children learn on yeah. their own right and let them keep an open mind and challenge and question everything because why? Peter, it's one. <laughs> it's one life. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I guess in a nutshell, what my whole mission from my own personal perspective is how do we get all of us to wake up and understand that things that are being taught to us or I call it brainwashing, things that we've been brainwashed about is it's first and foremost questionable. And with that comes the the power of the individual, the one life, that each person, everything that we it's, it's within us, happiness, success, finding yourself, passion. I mean, I think every one of these things, we all have the ability in ourselves to have it. And again, I think one of the things that's a shame is we've been taught over time that we don't have power. We don't have the ability to make change. And we're just one person or we're just one small individual with very little resources or money. And again, I think that's just complete bullshit because every one of us has that ability to make massive, massive change. And and it was, it's interesting that we're having this conversation today because last night we're having this conversation at this event that was at, and a woman came to me and said, do you think that that trait or that that drive is, you're born with it? Like there's some people have it more than others. And I look at it and I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm going to challenge that. I think it's within every one of us to have that drive to move forward. And she kind of looked at me with this look of, yeah, I don't think – you're on point on that. And I'd say, okay, let me make an example. It's like if we took that thought process that some have and some don't, then most of us shouldn't be walking, right? And I use a stupid little example because look at a baby. Most all of us that are healthy are able to walk. But the concept of walking is as stupid and simple as that is, it is one of the hardest things to learn because you're this, you start off as this little slab of flesh laying there. You can't move uh, anything. A little potato. Yeah, a little, little <laughs> thing. And then somehow you figure out a way to flip over, to start crawling, and then you start walking. And then at that point, you learn how to jog and run. And that doesn't happen overnight. You know, that happens over a long period of time with mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of failures falling on your butt, falling on your face. But somehow babies and little children learn, we all learn to take that incredibly difficult task and find a way to actually get it done. My theory is if we were learning how to walk, if we had to learn how to walk at the age of like 12, I would say 90% of us wouldn't be walking because we'd start hearing all the crap from people. Oh, who do you think you are? You think you're better than I am. You can't walk. If I can't walk, you can't walk. And you go through this process where you start getting influenced and manipulated by everybody else that's saying, you can't do this. And, you know, a little baby, they don't even understand whatever you're saying. So they're like, fuck that. I'm going to figure out a way that's to right. walk. That's right. Everyone else is walking. I'm going to yeah, walk. I'm going to figure out how to do mm-hmm. this because this so is true. what I have to do. And they figure out a way. And again, it comes from thousands and thousands of attempts and failures. And it's a stupid little example that I use. But to me, it's like we are all capable of doing incredible things. It's just we have to believe that, believe in ourselves and just go after it without, without having the fear overwhelm us and take control of us. So and have nothing to stop us and just i think that's the thing that we found is that leadership or this this renegade millionaire is really the one factor is that you see no other option but to be successful that's it and like what you talked about how you know you just have to stay focused forget about the 10 things you need to do just focus on the couple things and get it done and just deliver i think that's probably one of the biggest things that i've learned is you have to stay focused on, and I think there's what's a 10,000 hours. You do 10,000 hours of something to become a master at it, and that's hard to do if you're if you're if you're focused or trying to do 10 different things. It it gets very difficult to do, and and I think the other big thing with this is is the fear factor. You know, I have I have an obsession with fear, and it's something I'm constantly thinking about, playing with, toying with, and trying to understand because obviously it's a big, probably the biggest. Uh, component of what drives behavior one or, way or, or another. stops behavior right? or stops behavior and it's interesting because a lot of people look at me and see what I do and they say 
you're fearless, you're fearless. That's why you can, you know, make the decisions or jump out of an airplane or do whatever you're doing. And, you know, I, I hear this a lot and I, it brought a lot of thought on for myself reflecting because when I was younger, I was afraid of everything. I mean, I was a real full-blown scaredy cat. You know, I was just like, a, a, I, I couldn't even watch like um, scary horror movie commercials. I, when they come on, I'd have to close my eyes and plug my ears and go, la, 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 you know, because I was afraid of that. I was afraid of being alone. I was insecure. And through that process, somehow I learned that I got to get a control. I got to get a control of this situation because if I let all this fear take over my life, then I'm going to do nothing with my life. So as I started transitioning into just go for it, just do it. Don't worry about the consequences. Don't worry about you know uh, what this fear is going to do or the failures. And that created this image, I guess, of being fearless. And I think that, again, is another one of these misconceptions and these things that we've been taught that's complete bullshit because fear, everybody's afraid. Like every single person is afraid. The greatest hero, the baddest of badasses, they are afraid. The only difference is they don't let that fear consume them. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, and, and I think what happens is we're taught that to be successful or to do anything, you have to be fearless. So I'm, I try to think about putting myself in those shoes, and, and if I actually believe that, I'm going to look at someone who's done some incredible things and say, well, that person can do that because they're fearless. I'm, oh, I have so much fear in me, so therefore that's why I can't do that or be that person. And that's just not right. That's not, it's not true. It's not about being fearless. It's about – and in fact, I think it's the complete opposite. I think we always want to be in a state of fear because my belief is that when you're afraid – you know, there's chemical, physical changes that happen in your body, right? You have adrenaline being pumped. You have your senses. Your, That's so interesting. Everything, you, everything is totally in top mode. And you become superhuman in, in a sense because basically your body's preparing itself for fight or flight at its maximum level of survival. So you hear these stories of people like lifting big boulders or pushing cars off because they have so much adrenaline in them that they have become superhuman. And I look at that and say, well, then it's actually quite the opposite. We should always try to be in a constant state of fear because now our body is heightened and it's it's stronger and more powerful than it is if you're just kind of, you know, cruising along. So how do we get to that state and inst- and get there and not let that fear overwhelm you or take control of your body but use that as a tool to accomplish incredible things? So, I mean, again, I think this is one of those things that – Again, where we've been taught a complete wrong perspective, which basically keeps a lot of people down because when you're afraid and you compare yourself to someone else who appears to be not being afraid, it, the difference isn't the fear. It's what you're doing with that fear. So it's something that I've, you know, I'm constantly playing around with. So you're saying, I mean, from what we say, you're saying embody the fear, be okay with it, embrace yep. it. And I... In some ways, just celebrate it and know that's part of you, right? Yeah, it's part of life. It's part of what it is, is to constantly, I mean, we're afraid. And, you know, the whole bravery and courage, is, it's not about not being afraid. It's being, It's about when you're afraid, you still choose to go out and do what you do. So, you know, I think that's a really important thing that, you know, a lot of different, I guess, lessons that I try to pass on to my kids. And we have a joke because we'll, we'll talk about this all the time, and they'll be like, okay, Daddy, life lesson 1,731. <laughs> and we, we start, like, writing all these life lessons down. But, you know, a lot of the bulk of it really comes down to question everything and understand and believe that you have a tremendous amount of power and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So that would be – that's the thing that we constantly talk about with my children and, you know, really the message I want to share with everybody else because, you know, I look at myself. I'm a really average guy. Average intelligence. I didn't score. I did like I just barely got through school. I'm not physically gifted. I mean, I'm I'm a pretty normal, average guy. And I look at myself and say, if I can get, if I can find this place, and I'm not the richest guy in the world. You know, I haven't done like the craziest things, but I I feel like I'm in a place where I'm super. I'm really happy. I'm ready. To, I have. I don't really have regrets. I can die today and say, you know what? It's been a good life. It's it's all good. And, you know, I find that if I can get to this place, because a lot of people always ask, well, what's the key, the secret? I'm like, well, there is no secret because if I can do it, I believe that most everybody else can do the same thing and find the same level of 
of happiness and satisfaction and joy and passion in their lives. So again, this is something that I hope to share with a lot of other people, which is take control. This is your life. You know, everything that you have, it's based on your choices. So why not choose to live an amazing, great life? So perfect. So Peter Kim, so inspirational. And you have shared with everybody. And what you've done today is a gift and will change somebody out there listening. So I'd love to just further thank you, Peter, um, for this fascinating conversation. And more than that, very meaningful and thoughtful and and caring and being so generous with yourself. Um, Thank you for sharing your fashion and your compassion with us. Uh, this is Winnie Sun broadcasting from the gorgeous TuneIn.com studio in sunny Venice Beach. Again, this is Renegade Millionaire, and I hope that you'll tune in with us next time. To learn more about me, you can find my profile on LinkedIn under Winnie Sun and check out Sun Group Wealth Partners at sungroupwp.com. And follow us on Twitter at hashtag SunGroupWP. And on that note, uh, Peter and I stay connected via Facebook. So I do invite you to look him up on Facebook and Hudson Jeans that way and just stay connected because he does share some pretty, pretty remarkable stories. Thank you. Until next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.